You're listening to Caravan broadcast on CKUT 90.3 FM on the dial www.ckut.ca on the internet. On November 2nd, we brought to you the breaking news from Ehab Al Tayyif. He sent us this message I am on board the Tahrir, the Canadian boat to Gaza with activists from Canada, the US, Australia, Palestine, and Egypt. We are also accompanied by a few media people. Alongside us is the Irish boat to Gaza, the Sir She, with Irish activists on board. I send my warmest thanks first to all who in any way made this mission possible and regret that not everyone who wanted and planned to be on board is with us. This was the first message we got from Ihab Lutaif while he boarded El Tahrir, the Canadian boat to Gaza. Ihab Lutaif is with us today in the studio and uh, as well as uh, Stéphane Christophe. Welcome uh, Ihab uh, to Montreal and to CKUT, to Caravan. We kept our listeners posted all along and uh, today we're very pleased to have the news from you. So essentially, we want to know everything in detail, as much as our time allows us, from the uh, minute you left uh, and were on board Tahrir, the Canadian boat to Gaza, till you returned to Montreal or maybe to Toronto. And thank you, Sama, and thanks to, to everybody in, in Montreal who and in whole, the whole of Canada and the whole world, actually, who supported us. And uh, really, while we were in, uh, in, in Israeli jails and we knew that uh, people are supporting us, although we were kept in total information blackout, uh, we knew that the, the world would not be silent about, uh, about what we are going through and about our uh, ordeal. And, um, and more importantly, the world uh, will not forget about the Palestinian people of Gaza, the one and a half million people who are in jail and have been in jail for a long time, subjected to this collective punishment that's inhumane and illegal. Um, the message you mentioned, Sama, uh, that I sent, I sent from on board the, the Tahrir, where uh, we we had uh, quite a good, solid um, uh, internet connection from from on board. Um, we sent it only when we reached international waters because one of the things that we had planned from the very beginning is that we are not going to announce ourselves to the world except when we are in international waters after what happened earlier this summer in Greece when Israel put pressure on the Greek government and the boats of the Freedom Flotilla, the second Freedom Flotilla, uh, did not manage, most of them at least, with the exception of one, did not manage to leave towards Gaza. So we adopted um, uh, us and the Irish boat to Gaza uh, we planned quietly and we adopted the, the policy that we will not announce, we will not make a public campaign except when we are in international waters heading uh, to Gaza. Uh, of course, it was only uh, us. Be before, yeah. before that, you, you leave from uh, Tur Turkey, Have I understand that not all passengers, as you mentioned here in your uh, release, were able to, to board uh, the, the flotilla, your, your boat. Was it because it was too small or... <laughs> Um, that, that was a sad situation, as, I, as you read in, in my email, and it was as follows, really, and the, the analysis that I will make is only my analysis or our analysis. There is no proof that this was absolutely the case. Um, our boat is registered for, for 50 people, for up to 50 people, the Canadian boat to Gaza, and uh, the Greeks... Uh, although they didn't let us leave to Gaza, never disputed that that registration. Um, now, when we were in Turkey and we were never told that the Turkish authority doubted that we were going to Gaza or knew that we were going to Gaza, but I think they wanted to cover our, their own uh, backsides and they didn't want to appear in any way neither supportive nor obstructive to our mission to Gaza. So they... Um, they put the harshest restrictions they could. The Tahrir is registered as a private boat. It's not registered as a commercial boat. So they put the, the strictest restriction they can as they can put on a private boat and thus limited the number of passengers to, to 12. And that caused a huge problem to us, more emotionally than, than anything, because there were over 30 people that traveled over there to, uh, to, to join the boat, and uh, many of them were quite sad, and if I was in their position, I would have been quite sad as well. Um, we, as, as the steering committee members that were there, had to really make the difficult decision, and um, we, we made the decision uh, to have uh, two of the main organizers that the trip was depending on 
And then we, we added to that one passenger or one delegate from every country. So we had one Canadian, one Australian, one uh, um, American, and one Palestinian uh, on, on board. And then when we came to the journalists, the same thing. We had to cut any news team that had two people by half. So we ended up doing the most pragmatic thing we can to get the most out of the trip. But that, of course, did not solve the, 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 the emotional side and the personal side side uh, of, 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 the, of the matter. So, well, well, it was a good thing that you were not 50 people, Ihab, because this boat seemed very small, frankly. I, I really uh, w was worried that you would not even make it to the international waters. This is like a pleasure boat. It's not a, a boat for a crusade. And uh, it, it's, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was surprised when, when I saw it. Um, the the boat would not have been comfortable for um, for for 50 people or actually the 32 or 35 people that were supposed to go on at this time. They surely would not be comfortable for a two day trip. But it wouldn't have put the boat in danger or the people in danger in in any way. Uh, sleeping would have been a bit uncomfortable for 30 people. You know they would have been stepping on each other's toes every now and then. But the boat is registered for that. I mean the boat has a certificate for up to 50 people. So uh, it's not that we were reckless by, by considering that number or we're going by our own whim. Uh, okay. So w what happened after you reached international waters? We reached international waters uh, late on, on Wednesday, Eastern Mediterranean time, uh, on, on, on November 2nd. And as I mentioned, at that point, we told the media that were with us. And as I said, we had a satellite connections and everything that now we're going to announce ourselves. And uh, we are going to tell the world that we are here heading to Gaza and that Israel could not stop Freedom Flotilla 2 or the freedom waves that followed Freedom Flotilla 2 from departing to Gaza, no matter how hard it tried. Um, the, uh, the, the, the media, actually Democracy Now! was on the air at that time. So the, the journalists from Democracy Now! on board uh, reached them before, just before minutes before Amy Goodman got off, uh, got off the, the air. And, uh, and then the other media, Al Jazeera and uh, Press TV and uh, the Arabic-Egyptian uh, paper, Al Masri Liom, they all sent the reports out. And uh, at that time, we were bar ba barely in international water. We were still between Greece and Turkey, you know, very, very far from anything. And we were very comfortable and we were celebrating. We were really uh, celebrating. And I remember that uh, I did an interview that evening with, uh, with, with the Egyptian uh, uh, journalist and she said, are you afraid? I said, no, we're still, I mean, maybe I will get afraid later, but right now we were really just jubilant and happy and comfortable that we broke loose from this uh, is Israeli pressure. And, um, and that was it. We sailed, we sailed throughout the night. Uh, another factor of having to reduce the number of people on, on board is some of the people that were going to come on board had a sailing experience and they were supposed to act as co uh, captains or, or, or crew for the captain and we had to cut out of those as well and we had to the captain who is a very efficient and very clever Greek activist captain had to train the two young men that were with us on board uh, Majd from Palestine and Michael from Australia to act as his crew and astonishingly enough they took the wheel for three hours each uh, during during the time he slept so we were really working as a team as a very close-knit team very supportive very little sleep but very strong uh, will and determination. Um, the next day we sailed and we were going very well, both us and the Irish boat. We came, we, we were sailing close to each other, which gave us a lot of course of moral support. We were communicating. We had walkie talkie sets that we were communicating with other than the standard radio. And the, the day went very smoothly and very well. And then we started to do calculations by the time the sun was setting on, on Thursday. And we realized that if we go at this speed, we're going to enter the Israeli self uh, determined or self uh, announced uh, exclusion zone of a hundred nautical miles, sometimes in the middle of the night. And we decided that we don't want to do that. So we quickly took the decision together that we're going to slow down so that we don't reach that 100 uh, nautical mile line before 7 or 8 in the morning in, in sunlight. And again, that was a very um, good uh, de de decision to make. And we were, we were in contact directly all the time with our steering committee here in, in Canada and the home teams of everybody on board in different countries around the world. So the information was shared and agreed upon by, by everybody in a really cooperative manner. Um, 
So we woke up. Uh, those of, some some of us, of course, woke up very early on, on 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 Friday to see where we are. You know, and I, I sat in the captain's cabin for a while with him, uh, determining how far are we now, how far exactly. Looking at his radar, looking at the maps on my laptop, and uh, when we determined we are entering the hundred nautical mile uh, zone, uh, then we we all went into high alert mode. Um, I'm sure some people got more worried than others, but I can tell you honestly that the general atmosphere was not that of worry or concern. We were all quite calm. We were all quite clear that we will not give the Israelis any reason to harm us. It's not to mean that they will not, because we know the type of army they are and the type of, of mentality they put their soldiers in. But we at least were very clear that we'll play our game. We will do passive resistance. We will not cooperate I, with them. I guess I heard that you were had training in passive resistance, so you had agreed that you will not... Absolutely. Uh, uh, How do you say protest? We will not provoke. We will not provoke. We will not cooperate, but we will not provoke, and we will not we will not do anything that will bring harm upon us. And we kept reminding each other. You know, I spoke to somebody and told him, you know, remember that if you put yourself in, in, danger. in danger, you're yes. putting me as well because I'll have to defend you, or I might even subconsciously react to. So, so we we talked about that a lot in a very in a very healthy and 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 camaraderie way that uh, that that was very helpful. Let's take a, a short break and we'll, we'll continue with the story. Listening to a caravan broadcast on CKUT 90.3 FM on the dial www.ckut.ca on the internet. In the studio, we have Ehab Lutayef, uh, who just returned from uh, Israel, where he was incarcerated for five days. So, uh, Ehab, then what, what happened? Um, for a few hours, we sailed uh, smoothly and uh, we didn't see any sign of Israeli warships and we were looking at the radars and uh, nothing in the in the range of our modest radar that was showing. And then all of a sudden, uh, at the, on the horizon and in the radar, we started seeing big pieces, uh, uh, big frigates, two, two on, uh, on one side and one on the other side. And then uh, I went back to the, I, I was mostly controlling, or I was the one controlling the, the, the direct Uh, satellite link so I went back to and I asked people you know are you losing connection are you so we started to find that the communications are going up and down and those who are following us probably realized we also had a spot device that was tracking us live on uh, and that also st people tell us started to to uh, lose some of the of the 10 minute reports that it was doing so we knew that this is the typical scenario that happened before with many boats and with the freedom flotilla uh, before and we realized what's what's starting to happen so um, the first thing uh, we did is those of us who had laptops with, with delicate information on them, we threw our laptops into the sea. That was really the first the first thing we did. Uh, really? You did that? Oh, absolutely. I, I did that and it was very difficult for me to do. Uh, but but I had to do it. I mean, I was I, I had my mindset to that and three other people as well had their mindset to that. Uh, you couldn't risk uh, having your, your information going to, to the Israelis. And we proved right. I mean, I'll tell you the rest of the story because it doesn't matter if it ends up with, with in the sea with the, with, with, the, with the fish or with the, with the Israelis. Uh, so Um, we did that, and then we started getting hailed. We started getting hailed. Um, Tahrir, Tahrir, this is the Israeli uh, uh, Navy. And uh, uh, I, I called the Sirsha. I said, Sirsha, can you hear the same thing? They said, yes. Uh, um, you respond. So I, I went into uh, uh, the, the, the communication with the Israelis. I said, yes, Israeli Navy, this is the Tahrir. Uh, what do you want? He said, what's your destination? Uh, and I had spoken with David Heap the night before, and he said, we have to tell them that our destination is the conscience of, uh, of, of, uh, of humanity. And... Uh, Um, and I said, uh, okay, I mean, it's, it's nice. But then when I thought of it more, I realized it's not only a symbolic thing. It's also the fact that as soon as you tell them your destination is Gaza, you're giving them the quote unquote legal on their point of view, okay, to attack you. So let's postpone that as much as possible. So we started this. I told them our, our, our destination is the conscience of humanity. And they repeat again, what's your destination? The conscience of humanity. So he says, what is your final destination? So I said, <laughs> the betterment of mankind. And, and they got, you know, they start getting agitated a little bit. But who, who cares? I mean, this is really what, mm -hmm. what we're there for. 
Um, and and um, we kept going that way. And then for a certain period of time, they started relenting a little. So what if we inspect you and, and let you go? And then uh, we started communicating on the side with the Irish. What do you think about that? And we said, no, I mean, that's not in our mandate. We, we're not going to give them the uh, acknowledgement that they have the right to inspect us. If they board us and inspect us and then let us go, that's their choice. But we do not approve of their, of their self-imposed blockade. Uh, uh, so, so that was the, the second part of it. I mean, I don't want, we don't have much time. I do realize that. So there are lots of details, but at the end of, of a couple of hours, we were at the end of this back and forth things. And they said, we are going to board you. And we said, please do not harm anybody. We are not going to fight with you. We want to make that very clear. So there, it's best if you board with a few number of people that are not uh, heavily armed. We are not going to uh, be uh, fighting back. And of course, that all did not did not work. And uh, they, um, they, uh, they, they came and boarded and in a, in a very funny way where they um, started by... Water, uh, water cannons? I first, they ordered us to all go in clear view. Like everybody on the boat, go to the bow, uh, the bow of the boat in clear view. So I was standing on the bow already, and they started hitting me with the water cannon. So I was telling the guy, you want us to be here, yet you're hitting those who are here with the water cannon. What exactly do you want? And they were acting so dumb that they just continued directing the water cannon to me, at me. So I went into the captain's cabin with the rest where more, more, most of the people were, which is the only place on the top deck that is closed and we all nearly all all 12 of us huddled in inside the the, the caps cap. they started using their their mechanical elevators because their their boat or their uh, whatever it's called was much lower than the tahrir so they were lifting a sort of mechanical lift to get to our level and jump on our boat and they kept as soon as they got up they, the, the both ves, uh, vessels were away from mm -hmm. each other a little bit so they would go down again and they were really in, in total disarray i mean there was not this efficiency that we live in our heads that is the Israeli army, non official. The, the second person who stepped on board of the Tahrir slipped in the wet deck, which they wet, and fell uh, a, a bad fall. And this is the type of thing that causes bodily harm, you know. One of them falls, and while he's falling, he could shoot his gun, you know, like it, it, voluntarily or mm -hmm. intentionally. Um, so, um, so that was that was the the, 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 the the end of this of this phase. The, the the final thing of it is that they tried to get us out of the the, the wheelhouse, and uh, me and David Heap said no, we want to stay with the captain here, and that's the point where they tasered uh, David. Um, and uh, it's not really the taser that 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 brought him out, but that they they came from both sides of the wheelhouse and they pulled him out, and then they pulled me following him. Uh, out to the to the open deck in the back, and they uh, they took control basically of the vessel. They searched us. They took everything that was that was on us. You know, um, cell phone, satellite phone, uh, 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 Bluetooth, uh, mm -hmm. anything they found on us. They they took, put in a big plastic bag, and uh, kept us on deck for a while, and then uh, took us downstairs. And the, the last thing that we started to realize is that all this attacking force was very sleepy. They were falling asleep while they were guarding us. So they, they put us, all 12 of us, except the captain who was still in the, in the wheelhouse, in, in one small sitting area inside the ship. And the, two, the three people that were guiding us were really swaying from sleep. And then I went to get something from my bag, which was in the bigger open area, and I found that the rest of the 25 or so attacking force were lying down just all over the place, sleeping. And then you ask yourself, how did people get killed? in previous missions. This is how the forces that are sent are not in alert position, no matter what you claim about, about their training or preparation or whatever. And I think that also has increased in this case because I think they had no idea that we had sailed. And when we announced ourselves, they scrambled to get a, a, a force in place to, to attack us. And they, they summoned this force and they kept them up for 36 hours. And that's why the situation was so pathetic of the attacking force itself. This weekend at Occupy Montreal, you gave a speech um, to people who gathered to support uh, the Canada boat for Gaza, the Tahir. Um, I'm wondering one of the th about one of the things you mentioned, um, and it provides a bit of context to a lot of what you were describing. There seems to be an effort to 
discuss the Israeli presence in that part of the Mediterranean is almost normalized. I'm wondering if you could discuss the illegality of the Israeli blockade and how that falls under kind of a consistent pattern of Israel um, violating international law and how the boat action was, has been really a response to um, Israel's consistent violations of international law. Well, according according to to all studies, this blockade is not legal and is not justified. And even the Palmer report, which people, some people hear about and think it's United Nations report, the Palmer committee, which is a four person committee, which is one of the few uh, bodies that gave any uh, um, uh, justification for the blockade. It's really not a judicial committee. It's a, it's a political committee that was set by the United Nations to sort of mend fences between Turkey and Israel. And uh, following that report uh, that included the notorious Arubi uh, from Central America, who himself is a very questionable uh, ex-ruler, um, is, is, uh, was, was right away answered by a panel of four independent United Nations human rights experts that said that the blockade is illegal. Unfortunately, we live in Canada. We live in Canada where our government says everything Israel does is right. And thus, our population uh, doesn't hear much about what the op opposition is. Our position was very clear. Mm -hmm. Our position was that this is undoubtedly unjust. I mean, at best, it's unjustified, but it's really worse than that. It's illegal and inhumane, and it should not exist, and there is no justification for it whatsoever. And that's why we are challenging it and continue to challenge it and will continue to challenge it. Ihab, what happened to uh, the goods that you were carrying in the boat? Did they reach uh, the Palestinians in Gaza? Um, lots of stuff was stolen, including the boat itself. Let's start with the boat, including our personal belongings, our satellite, yes, our satellite phones, whatever uh, computer equipment and satellite communication equipment were on the boat. All that was taken, including the medicine that we were taking to uh, to, to Palestine, to Gaza. Um, but um, we got a communique just a couple of days ago from uh, the United Nations Special Force, which is set uh, um, uh, uh, as a liaison force uh, between between Israel and, and Gaza to deliver our medicine. And we, we refused. We said, we want our goods to be put on our boat and delivered to Gaza that way. Now the Israelis have the boat. They've be, they, had it for, they have it for over a week now. They know quite well what's not on the boat, and they should give it back to us and let it sail. And we are again talking to the Canadian Foreign Affairs with an open mind, not with great hope, that they should support us in this, in this request. We are talking to all our, our, our allies from other movements who have boats already in Israel, and we are going to continue launching uh, that. Um, the, our aid supplies that we are taking to Gaza have long-term expiry dates. They will not be lost if they don't get delivered today or tomorrow or this week or next month. And we continue to demand that it is our right to take those uh, to Gaza because it is very important to assert all the time that it's not only about the humanitarian aid. The problem is much bigger than that. It's the humanity of the people in Gaza. It's the right to live as humans. It's the right to know that the world did not forget about them. It's our right to challenge the, 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 the fascist governments that impose or support this blockade. And this is the bigger message, bigger than the aid that we are taking to Gaza. Now, ju just one last remark you have, because I read this recently. Uh, it seems that one of the reasons that Israel gave for the blockade in Gaza was the detention of the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. And now that he has been released and exchanged for Palestinian prisoners, then this reason no longer holds. However, the blockade has not been lifted. Have you heard about this? I've heard something much more important. I've heard with my own ears that Israel and all the Israeli authorities that we have met lie. If there's one thing they do consistently, they lie. If one thing you can trust that they're going to do next time when they talk to you is that they're going to lie. And imagine my... My, my, my shock, pleasant shock, when the first thing I heard from the people that met us in Toronto airport, did you hear what Sarkozy, Sarkozy. And, 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 and Obama were talking to each other about how Netanyahu lies? This is the lesson. So why they impose the blockade on Gaza? Because of Shalit, it's a lie. Everything they say is a lie. It is an expansionist, uh, uh, colonizing state that has only that in mind.
I, I'm just going to ask you to justify this statement. You have one, one minute when you say they, they are lying. Do you have proof for that? Absolutely. They kept telling us that. First thing they told me, among all the 27 people, whoever signs that they're ready to be, uh, not want to, 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 meet, to see a judge and want to be deported right away, will be deported within 24 hours. I was the only one within the 27 who signed that. As long as it didn't admit guilt about something, I said, I don't have a problem to sign. I signed. I was released six days later. Everybody who met us told us a different story about what our condition is, what law we fall under, whether it's a political detention or an immigration detention, when we will be released, what's our next meal going to be, when our next meal is going to be coming, um, who is going to come see us, if they're going to allow us phone calls. Everything was changing every second by every person we meet. It's just that is the culture that, that, that we met in the, 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 the five days we spent in Israeli jails. Can can you offer at all, very briefly, what is the humanitarian situation in Gaza today? How are people living? The, the people in Gaza today, if they are not employed by the United Nations, uh, the UNRWA, or the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian government, they are unemployed. This is the biggest problem in Gaza. Gaza is living a... a, a artificial life. There is no business, there is no work, there is no productivity because there is no trade with the outside world. Israel wants them to depend on aid. This is what we refuse. I mean, it might sound as, as, as a contradiction, but this is something we refuse and they refuse. And when I visited Gaza, that's the first thing that people were saying. We do not want to live on charity. We want to be able to create life and that cannot create life. This is the situation in Gaza. Loss of hope, loss of, of, of look at the future, uh, uh, um, uh, high unemployment, uh, uh, sewage that is being pumped into the sea uh, right meters away from the shore because there's no sewage uh, treatment. Um, the one thing that isn't really is it is not a, a situation of starvation like we see in the Horn of Africa, for example. That is not existent in Gaza. But that is not existent because Israel is intelligent enough to not make that exist because it knows that that's what will bring more sympathy to the people of Gaza. But it's not that Gaza is living in any way a healthy life. Gaza deserves, and whole of Palestine deserves to be a country that deals with the world, that has its fate in its own hands, and that's what the world should be pushing for and supporting. So and we didn't get a chance to talk about more details about what happened in, in Israeli jail, but uh, I think the listeners have had a general idea. Well, inshallah, we'll, we'll have another opportunity, but I see that you became more radicalized, if we can say that, than before you left. Uh, and absolutely so, because when you see the thing firsthand and when you realize that there are 10,000 Palestinian prisoners who are living under the conditions that... that w- that, that much worse than what we lived under. We were living in paradise compared to what they're living in for five days. When you see these things, when you feel them firsthand, you become more, 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 more emotionally opposing to what, to what you were more mentally opposing to before. Thank you so much, Ehab Lutayef. Inshallah, we will continue this conversation.